Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm um, really excited to kick off our last um, live stream CareerCon session, and it's titled Real Stories from a Panel of Successful Career Switchers. So in this session, we've asked three working data scientists to candidly share their backgrounds and unique journeys to data science. Each of the panelists today have been featured in Career Track info infographics on our blog. So if you haven't seen those yet, I uh, encourage you to go to nofreehunch at blog.kaggle.com and check out their journeys. And if you have any kind of specific questions for any of the panelists, feel free to share them on YouTube Live or um, in our Slack Q&A channel. And we'll get those asked at the end of the session. Um, so I'd like to start off and let the panelists introduce themselves and talk about what they're doing now in their current role um, and kind of what that looks like on the day-to-day. -day. So why don't we start with you, Jess? Yeah, my name is Jesse Mostapak, and I am the Director of Data Systems and Analysis for Teaching Trust. We are an education management nonprofit here in Dallas, Texas, and we really look to develop school leaders as a way to improve student academic outcomes. Um, and my day is kind of a 50-50 split between doing actual data science and then also focusing a lot on strategic planning. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at what does it look like to build a data science team? How do we build a data-driven culture? Um, and then how do we kind of build best practices for data science within a nonprofit organization? And Megan? Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Megan Rizdahl, and I'm a data scientist and product lead at Kaggle. Um, I work on data sets, um, our public data platform, and I do community, community advocacy more broadly. Um, I work out of the Google office in Los Angeles, um, where it's usually very sunny, but today extremely rainy. Um, so uh, kind of in my day to day, uh, I get to wear many hats in my role. Um, and kind of how things break down is um, I do a lot of uh, building awareness of Kaggle's platform and tools um, among data scientists. Um, and I do things like uh, develop content, uh, technical content, tutorials, demos on our platform work with other people internally to develop this type of content. Um, and then uh, I also act as a liaison between our community and our engineers and designers. Um, and then more recently, um, where it's really exciting to be part of this panel talking about career, um, career, career switching is I feel like I'm really still evolving in uh, you know, my career switch. Um, lately, I've assumed more product mm -hmm. leadership roles, um, focusing on specifically on our public data platform. Um, having an opportunity to work really closely with our engineers and designers on our roadmap. Um, and then uh, I guess I'd say like, although what I do isn't necessarily what a typical data scientist does um, in their day to day, um, a common theme for me is being able to understand and advocate what data scientists do, um, communicate um, that and have an influence on um, how they use our product. So okay. that's me. And then David? Yeah, thanks Anna. So. My name is David Havera. I'm really excited to be here today. I am in my first data scientist role. I work for um, GE Aviation and I'm based out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, the, uh, the business unit that I work in has about 150 data scientists globally um, with about half that amount in the US. And the group um, looks to, you know, about a fourth of it looks externally to sell solutions to our aircraft engine customers. And then the remainder looks internally to help with productivity projects. So I'm on the internal facing side um, where um, I work with the various shops that we have um, across the world to figure out ways to um, make aircraft engine parts cheaper and more efficiently. So it's, it's really fun. It's, um, I work a lot with engineers, so I get to I get to learn how the the aircraft engine operates. And but I also work with a lot of different functions. I work with the supply chain. I work with our IT leadership. I work with our commercial team. So I've been with the business for about 15 years, primarily in finance. So it's something different. And I'm also since data science science is a newer field, I consider myself an ambassador in in helping establish this field in aviation. So thanks. Great. And we're really excited at just how diverse our panel is in terms of kind of what you do on the day to day and what types of companies you work for. So um, we're excited to talk about more about that later. But I mean, to really get into kind of this career switching aspect, which is why we're all here, I'd love to hear about what other career options kind of pre data science um, you explored and, you know, ultimately why you decided to 
um, move away from them. That maybe why they weren't a good fit. Uh, so Megan, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. Um, so um, I think the first part of your question was um, kind of what, where was I before data science? Um, yeah. And uh, I guess going back to like uh, the things that I highlighted in uh, my my winding path to data science and my infographic on the blog, um, really I, I I thought I was going to be a musician, a uh, performance artist. Uh, you know, this is in high school. I played oboe for you know over a decade. Uh, I went to a, a music conservatory, played oboe, thought I was going to you know this was it. I was going to be a musician, um, and I ended up getting a repetitive stress injury. Um, had to sort of like have, you know, have this moment of self-reflection and decide what I want to do. Um, so I ended up studying uh, social sciences. I got a bachelor's in psychology um, from a state college in Wisconsin. Um, and I also studied French that got me interested in, in languages. Uh, that took me to studying uh, linguistics, uh, quantitative linguistics at uh, NC State. Um, and this is really um, kind of, um, you know, my educational path is where I, I sort of fell in love with research, working with data. Um, and, um, uh, you know, at that point, uh, you know, when I was doing a master's degree in linguistics, I really felt like, okay, I'm gonna be, uh, you know, I'm gonna stay in the academy. Ac academy. Um, I'm gonna become a researcher, I'm gonna study linguistics, write papers, become a professor, get tenure, um, all of those things. And I sort of felt like, okay, this is my trajectory. Um, so I decided to do a PhD in linguistics at UCLA. Um, and then a year into it, uh, I sort of, you know, started to feel a little bit disillusioned with um, uh, academia and uh, felt like I was very personally excited in working with data and using data to answer really uh, research questions that I felt were really interesting. Um, but uh, Academia, uh, you know, academia felt really closed off to me, and you know, the stuff I was working on uh, was interesting to, like, highly interesting to a really small group of people. So um, I explored um, applying for for jobs outside of, um, you know, uh, grad school, and I ended up getting an interview at Google, um, and that's really what that was like the moment for me that I realized, like, okay, I can do this. I don't need to stay in academia. I didn't end up getting the job, but it, it's what gave me the confidence to know that I had skills that I could apply outside of um, uh, research. So, awesome. And David, how about you? Yeah, so, you know, ironically, I grew up in a, a really small town in, in the middle of Illinois farming community. So if anyone can make it, if I made it in data science, um, anyone can make it. In high school, we had a keyboarding class, which I didn't do well because I couldn't type fast enough. So. Um, humble beginnings but anyway I st started my career in finance because I always like numbers and um, I always like to read and research personal finance on the side so it, it kind of fit with ultimately when I made that change to data science because I feel like I could read really books every day or research some kernel on, on Kaggle it's, it's it's addicting but it's addicting in a good way but ultimately um, my career 13 14 years in corporate finance I I decided to change it because it really wasn't my passion anymore. Um, for me, I'm, I'm a passionate person. I'm, I'm full of energy and I need to have that fire when I go to work. And the journey for me changed when my daughter, she's four now, when she was two, she got diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia. And um, it was just, you know, it was one of those life altering experiences that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy, but we're, we're all stronger as a result. But the, the medicine that she took, the chemotherapy was 50 years old. So there's a lot better treatments that are coming out. I always made the argument with my wife that there's got to be data out there where we can figure out a way to help these sick kids. And that kind of one thing led to another and then it led me to Kaggle and data science. And um, I've made the jump and I'm here, here now talking to you guys. But ultimately, my goal is to help with pediatric cancer research. And I will do that with the skills that I learn at work and transfer it to my hobby outside of work. It's such a touching story, obviously, and it's also, I mean, I love when Kaggle hosts competitions in medical research. I'm sure you do too, and I know there's a lot of people even on our open data platform that you know, probably have common interests, so yeah, you're able to connect with some people. Uh, and Jeff? Yeah, so similar to Megan, um, I started out in academia. I went from, it took me eight years to finish an undergrad, um, and then 
graduated into the 2008 recession, um, which is about as much fun as everybody tells you it is. Um, so I went to grad school, loved working in the lab, um, and I didn't listen to anyone's advice. I was the first person in my family to go to college, definitely the first to go to graduate school. Um, and everybody tells you, choose the professor, not the project. And I was like, it's totally fine. Like, I've got this. Um, and I chose a project that I loved. I was studying um, the neurological transmission of the infectious prion protein, which is responsible for things like mad cow disease. I was really interested in moving into neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, um, MS, things like that as kind of a career in academia. Um, but I just, after three years of running the same Western blot over and over and over and still getting the same results and having an advisor who said, well, it's still you, it's not, it's not the research. Um, I was just like, it, it can't be me. Um, there was, so it was, it was kind of this moment of self-reflection where there was no course-based masters, there was no department masters. So it was either leave um, with nothing or stick it out for, for as long as it took. Um, so I did leave um, and I did, you know, as Mark kindly pointed out in one of our interviews, I left with the knowledge of R. I took a statistics course. I learned how to use R. Um, that probably is where all of this kind of started and took hold. Um, I moved to New York City. Um, and I taught high school science. So I transitioned from kind of studying science to teaching science. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I love teaching. I love teaching high school. I love teaching high school science. Um, my first data science project was actually um, looking at tests, uh, New York State tests, and then pulling out keywords and doing a text analysis, and then building my curriculum on the most common words. Um, and I just loved it. I thought it was the most fan. It, it felt like a calling. It's the first thing I think I ever did where I was like, this is what I'm meant to do. Um, and it just, I overworked myself. I was working six days a week. I was putting in an 80 hour work week. Um, I had really poor time management skills and I just, I burned out, um, really, really fast. Um, so it was just, yeah, that was kind of where I ended up taking some time off to really think about, um, what I liked doing and what I was capable of doing. Um, and it was around the time that data science was kind of building, uh, momentum as a career choice. And it was definitely a moment, um, of timing where I thought, you know, I can do that. Um, I can definitely make that leap. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to do so. Great. Um, so we have a question coming in that I was already planning to ask, so it's perfect, um, which is just, you know, what skills um, best prepared you or what roles best prepared you for the work that you're now doing as a data scientist? So whether they're soft skills or, you know, hard skills, but what have you been able to really use from seemingly unrelated roles in your roles now? Um, and David, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Sorry, it took me a minute on the mute button. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And after reading and researching, you know, extensively as I entered this field, I think what I walked away with was that I needed to be an expert statistician, which I do not love statistics. I get through it. Um, and also the best coder out there in the world. But really, realistically, what I found is those skills are important, but um, it's much more important to have kind of the softer side of things. So the role that I think prepared me the most was a role when I, I was the finance manager for an acquisition site in England. And, um, you know, I was responsible for making sure that the site grew and, and recorded the $250 million of revenue properly. Um, and in that role, everything kind of went sideways and after the first audit, and I really had to rebuild the accounting structure but to do that, I had to take difficult concepts and communicate these accounting concepts to non-technical people. And to me, that's the heart of data science. If you can show people how you translate a huge amount of tetrabyte of data to a couple actionable results, then you can have them rally behind you um, and you can make an impact with data science. And I think in addition to that, in that role, I learned how to execute and, and also um, be responsible and, and take actions from my responsibility. Uh, so that's, that's me in a nutshell. Thanks. Yeah. And Jess, do you want to continue? Yeah, mine's very similar um, to what David said. It, it's the ability to communicate knowledge. And so for me, it was teaching. So how do I take this big complex topic of biology or chemistry and how do I pull out what is the core idea that you need to know? And then how do we use that and break it down into component pieces so that, um, kind of the end user, it, in many cases students, but now coworkers and colleagues and, and the broader community, how do they then take ownership of this knowledge and build the foundational knowledge and then build levels up and, and build kind of on this core concept. So it's very much centered around being able to help other people, um, being able to communicate and help other people understand really what it is that you're trying to accomplish with data science. Great, and Megan? 
Yeah, I definitely agree uh, with both Jesse and David. Um, and I think what I'd add to that, um, you know, from my experience, I um, I had a lot of background in statistics through grad school. And um, I think, you know, like learning those fundamentals was really important. But um, one thing that really stood out to me was um, just the power of data visualization um, in communication. Um, I think that's something that, um, you know, um, uh, has really served me well, sort of um, translating from uh, academia to um, to more of a data science role where I have to, you know, communicate ideas from data with other people. A data visualization done well is really powerful. Um, and then another thing that I would add is um, being able to, you know, ask the right question um, and then being able to figure out um, you know, what kind of tools and what kind, what do I need to do to be able to answer this? And then um, how, how do I take that answer and communicate it? Um, that's something that I learned uh, from research as well um, that I say translates um, to data science, definitely. So we have a follow-up question, Jess, that I think was kind of sparked by something you said, which is, um, you know, in talking about your experience in research and so, you know, how does this kind of every person for themselves attitude that you can see in academia alongside some kind of, you know, lack of positive reinforcement compare to the work environment that you have in your companies right now in, in data science? Uh, yeah, so um, I work at an education organization, which means I'm pretty much surrounded by teachers. Um, so it's probably the most supportive environment uh, I've ever been in with people who really, really focus on high quality communication skills. Um, and I, I don't know that that is, um, you know, it's nothing like I've ever experienced. Um, I think it is very unusual to be surrounded by teachers and, and collaborating with teachers all the time um, within data science. Um, looking at some of my other positions though, um, I don't think I've ever been anywhere that is as dog eat dog as academia. Um, I've had a lot more support in every other organization that I've, I've worked in um, beyond academia. And, and, and some of that has to do with being able to find your network and the people who are on your team. Um, you know, being younger when I was in graduate school and not knowing how to advocate for myself or how to go out and build my own community. Whereas I think, you know, as you get older and you start to learn how to do those things, um, you can create a supportive network anywhere that you work, whether it's with the people you're, you're interfacing with every day or people outside of work. Um, it's a lot, it, you, you develop the skills to build your team. Great. And I know that, you know, Megan and David, you're at very different companies and I'd love to hear from you just about, you know, your perception of the kind of culture and the data science culture there. So Megan, do you want to go? Sure. Um, so I can kind of speak to two sides of it, right? I can speak to it as sort of a community member, you know, part of the Kaggle community um, and also um, in my role on the Kaggle team. Um, and I think uh, I've found it incredibly welcoming. It's, um, you know, Kaggle is a great place to get feedback on your work um, and, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, my work that I put out there on Kaggle is literally my work, um, you know, it's my job. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I found the, the um, community to be incredibly um, warm and welcoming. Um, and I've definitely seen it play out, um, you know, in, uh, you know, some of the stories we've heard from uh, competitors, um, how they sort of um, started compl as complete novices um, and, um, what they've learned through things like mentorship. Um, and then, um, yeah, within Kaggle, um, again, I think I've, uh, I've, yeah, I've found it a very welcoming environment. Um, I think the thing that has made it most rewarding for me is um, having a culture where you can get feedback on your work. Um, and um, I think that's really valuable to somebody who is maybe new to a role. Um, that they can sort of um, feel comfortable sharing sharing their work that you know maybe completely new to them they're not sure how to tackle it and then get honest feedback from coworkers is is um, awesome. David. Yeah, sure. So I think that's that's a great question and interesting for me too. When I was making the switch over to data science, one thing that my coach who had been mentoring me over the years said that, you know, you got a lot of experience at this company, but be humble um, when you join it because you're going to have to relearn a lot of things. And I think that attitude has really served me well. I think one of my biggest worries and fears was joining the data science group that everyone would be, you know, the data science genius where they could code, um, 
it in 17 different languages and they can do statistics in their sleep. But what I found is it's really a, it's a broad range of experiences. Some people are great coders, some people are great at statistics, some people just have really good business knowledge. And I think that by understanding your unique fit to the group and being humble in areas that you don't know and, and playing that collaboration, I think that it's worked really well at GE. And, and we are a team, we're all jointly responsible for our goals. And I think um, as a team too, at GE, it's such a new field, data science, how are we gonna do things? We're also responsible if, for, is data science really going to stick or is it gonna become a fad 20 years later like Six Sigma did and died out? So anyway, it's very collaborative, great at GE and um, I couldn't be happier. Awesome. Um, so I wanna dive into kind of this moment of making the switch, right? So. You have a resume full of, you know, seemingly maybe unrelated experience or, you know, no traditional data science experience. Um, so, you know, when you were interviewing for or looking for your first kind of data science role, you know, how did you effectively translate your skills into something that would stand out to, to people recruiting for data science? Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's the end of my question. <laughs> David, do you want to start? Yeah, so I, I thought a lot about this as I was on my journey, and I think that there's there's a couple different areas that to focus on. I think that if you're if you're going into data science, I think the first thing you have to look at: am I entering this field that am I entering an area where I have a functional expertise? For me, that's finance. So I think data science. Someone would want to pay me to do data science because I'm an expert at finance, and that's what I've specialized in my career in. The other area where you could go is you have a business experience. For me, that's GE Aviation. I've spent you know, you know, know, 12, 10 years there. So um, that's another area where people would pay you for that business acumen. The hardest is if you want to do something where you don't have the functional experience and you don't have the business experience. For me, that's the cancer research. It's why today I can't go get a job in cancer research because I don't have a functional experience or a business experience. And that's why I build that up. Um, so I would recommend targeting companies where you have a functional experience or the industry that you work in. Um, and one thing I've done in the past, even though it wasn't truly a data science role, but um, in my last role with GE Digital, I was a product manager and I took the role because I got to work very closely with data scientists. And I negotiated at the time that I took the role, I told my manager, I will take this role if you give me 20% of my responsibility as data science work so I can grow my network and I can really start learning what it's about at GE. So those are some recommendations that have worked well for me and that I've noticed as I've been in this career field. Cool. And Jeff? Uh, mine is kind of, um, I don't know how to tell someone else to replicate it. I think a lot of it was just dumb luck. Um, I was kind of, I was done teaching. I was reflecting a lot. Um, and at the time I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft, like a lot of video game time. Um, and I was like, I'm going to go code video games. That'll be totally cool. Like, I'm just forget, like, save the world. I'm, I'm going to do something super fun and that I'm just super into. Um, and so got on Twitter and this company was looking for people to be community managers. And I was like, well, you know, I don't really like blogging or, um, but I can, I can community manage and see where it goes. Um, and so the company was PVP Live. I was doing um, a couple of blog articles a week and we were having these meetings and I don't even remember how it happened, but something came up where they found out that I knew about data. Um, and then it led to conversations like, would you be interested in kind of a data position? Um, and then there was some back and forth and I realized like nobody at the company knew anything about data. Like I definitely came in with that expertise. Um, and so I was in this position where they were like, here's a data set, let's see what you can do. Um, actually, no, it wasn't even that. They were like, we want League of Legends data. What can you do with that? So I had to like go find the API and get an API key and doing all these things that um, I didn't know how to do, but I knew how to Google. Um, so I turned around and I, I kind of submit this like finished piece of like, here's my analysis of League of Legends. And they were like, great, like, let's hire you. What do you want your job title to be? Um, so it was, it was just like this weird situation with the startup of just being like, I like video games. I'm going to take some volunteer experience and then kind of roll it into a, a data science position. Awesome. And Megan? Cool. Um, I definitely like, uh, Jesse, what you, you say about it can feel like sort of dumb luck in a lot of situations <laughs> that definitely resonates with me. Um, so I guess like my advice, um, I might start with like what I don't recommend doing and 
I think if you want to do like career switch into data science, I wouldn't recommend just sort of like burying yourself in your basement and, um, you know, taking a MOOC and not, you know, just kind of like, you know, putting blinders on. I don't recommend doing that. Um, uh, I definitely rec recommend doing that in sort of like an iterative way. So, um, you know, take a single MOOC and then try to apply something that you learn, um, get something out there that's public, um, show that you can execute a project and, to, and um, to, you know, uh, compete in the Kaggle competition, um, you know, um, and then go back and see, you know, what kind of signals did you get from that? Did you get feedback um, from the community? Did you, um, you know, maybe try experimenting with applying for a data analyst job and seeing what happens? So get some signals um, about what's working. Try to get, um, you know, feedback from uh, going to like meetups and things like that, networking, um, and then go back, um, go back into your basement, go read some books, read blogs, um, you know, decide, you know, plan out the next step. Um, um, and what you're going to do um, based on sort of what you learned. Um, so um, I think that's kind of worked well for me. What I do even today is every three months or so, I sort of make a list of, okay, where, what kind of things do I need to do to, um, you know, in thinking about my longer term career tra trajectory, what, what kind of things do I need to do um, to make that happen? How do I need to break it down? What ways can, what kind of things can I do to sort of set myself up for moments of success? Um, even though a lot of times it can feel random. <laughs> so yeah, I want to point out an interesting overlap in what you said, Jess, and just, um, you know, I was actually a part of bringing Megan into Kaggle and I brought her in as a content marketing intern. Uh, so she was writing blogs, which, you know, wasn't probably what she wanted to do every day <laughs> for the rest of her life either. And, you know, similarly, I think all of you have kind of somehow managed to turn uh, new opportunity, find new opportunities that you're existing in your existing role, your existing company by showing off your skills. Um, and, you know, they're hugely valuable to companies. So that can be kind of one good way to parlay something into a data science role. Um, so, you know, what has felt like the biggest risk that you've taken in your career journey to become uh, a data scientist? And uh, what gave you the confidence that you needed to take that risk? Because, you know, it can feel like a really big plunge a lot of times to, you know, change roles or change directions. Megan, do you want to start? Yeah, I can definitely start. Um, and it's actually, yeah, quite easy, quite salient for me. It was definitely the decision to leave academia. Um, so, um, you know, starting a PhD in linguistics, um, was, I felt like a big, like I'm on this trajectory. I definitely felt like I was, I was, you know, this is, this is what's happening. Um, and I felt, you know, full confidence that I was going to see it through to the end. Um, and even when I was thinking of leaving, uh, it was a tough decision because I, I really did love what I was doing. Um, it was exciting to be, you know, paid to do, uh, research on acoustic phonetics and laboratory phonology, um, questions about, uh, you know, uh, how vowels are nasalized uh, was what I was doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I really loved that. So that's kind of why it felt like, you know, why give up a good thing? You know, this is working. Um, I love the people that I was working with. Um, so I think that's, that was, I felt like the biggest risk was um, deciding to leave. I ended up moving to, um, from, from Los Angeles to Pittsburgh, where my, um, my now husband uh, was living. Uh, we had met in uh, grad school at NC State, uh, where we were both in the English department. Um, so I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, without a job. We lived in his parents' bedroom. Um, <laughs> and all I had was this confidence of, oh, I, I got this single Google interview. Um, you know, I knew, so, you know, I got like one bite on my resume. Um, but um, so that definitely felt um, like the riskiest moment. And all I could do is sort of like, like I mentioned before, um, try to keep putting things out there to get signal that I was doing things right or doing things wrong. Um, and then hoping that it would you know, um, pay off and kind of like in the meantime, uh, continuing to kind of build my resume. So I was doing um, online courses, trying to, I created like a, a personal portfolio, um, like a, a microsite website. Um, that I, you know, Anna mentioned and, you know, when she <laughs> interviewed me uh, for my now role at Kaggle. So um, yeah, doing things like that, um, uh, I think helped me feel like it was less risky, even though it was very scary, so. And David? Yeah, sure. So I think for me, it's, 
Um, you know, if you ask my wife, she would tell you that her perspective is that I just woke up one day and decided to be a data scientist. So, <laughs> um, you know, I left a, a very well-known career that my entire career path had been in finance at GE. And I knew the trajectory. I knew what to expect. And I knew the, the technical stuff well, where I didn't, I didn't really need to learn in the evenings. I could just kind of shut it down and, and relax. And my data science opportunity came when I was um, up for a job change within finance. And also at the same time, we had just had our second child, a baby boy. So um, that was challenging to juggle um, a newborn at home as, as well as a new career field. But um, thankfully, we made it through and I used some of the lack of sleep and, and late night feedings um, to, to further study the data science piece. But it's, it is overwhelming and, and I'm fortunate enough to have been able to make that switch within the same company. But, um, you know, to Megan's point, I think you just got to keep um, putting yourself out there and, and know that there's going to be a lot of times when you're making a switch into such a new field um, that people may not understand it. You'll get a lot of no's, but just, you know, keep developing yourself and believe in yourself and eventually it will work out. Well, and Jack. Yeah, for me, I don't know. Um, I was in a position where I needed a job. Um, I was kind of running out of runway. It was it was not a pretty site. Um, and I was working with the startup and they were like, oh, you can work remote for a year. We'll see how it goes. We'll reevaluate everything. Um, and about a month into that, they called and they were like, you can move to Dallas so you can find a new job. Um, so I was <laughs> go to Texas. Um, and then it's, you know, so it was like, I need a job. I have this job. Um, but, but to put that in a little context, um, I've always lived up North. I've always lived places with four seasons. I would consider Montana home. I was living on a small farm outside of Bozeman. It was fantastic. It was everything I ever wanted. Um, and I just, I, I needed to decide, like, am I going to give up my one data science lead, um, and try and make it work in Montana? Or am I going to move to Dallas where, if this falls through, then um, then something else will will come up. Like I'll be in a good place to look look for another job. Um, so so it was more necessity. Um, it wasn't so much risk, but I still was uh, very nervous about moving to Texas. Yeah, and I think that's helpful for you know people that are nervous to make the switch, yeah. um, and just that there is going to be kind of a leap of faith, probably right, um, and that that's just going to be a part of your journey and you have to. Mm -hmm build up the confidence and the skill set to do that, like Meg and David were talking about. Um, so, you know, going back now that you've landed your first data science job. So I know some of you like David, you're in your first data science job. Um, is it all, you know, it, you thought it was going to be? Um, and, you know, what, what ways have you been surprised? I, I don't want to use the word disappointed, but like, you know, you probably build up a lot of expectations, right? You're very excited about making this career switch. Um, and then, you know, what has the reality been like? Uh, so David, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I think um, for me, the, the biggest thought, because I had immersed myself in like Kaggle and all the data science news was that everyone was on the data science bandwagon and it was taking over the world and um, there was no moving back. And then you, you go into a company like GE Aviation that's very profitable, that they're um, long cycle business. And it's actually kind of hard to get people to buy into your vision. And that's why I've really had to um, rely on the communication skills that I developed in finance of taking difficult technical uh, concepts, translating them to actionable tasks that people can do to drive value. Um, so for me, it was, you know, having still to establish that brand within the company was something that I thought was really interesting. And I had already thought that, you know, the entire company in the world was on that bandwagon. And I think the other thing I wasn't fully prepared or expected was that in data science, data science at GE anyway, you really have to justify savings. Um, it's not a job field that the company or a company will necessarily pay you to do if you're not seeing results. I mean, I could do data science on all sorts of fascinating things outside of work, personal finance and things like that and actually do that. But um, you really have to show results and that you're enabling savings. And um, like I mentioned earlier, so that this, you kind of complete the legacy and, and prove that this function adds value and will be in the long-term strategy for the company. And Jeff, do you want to go? Yeah, so my first data science job, I really had this impression that I was going to show up and I was going to sit in front of my computer and I was going to code and do data science all day long and it was going to be amazing. Um, 
And, and the reality was when you're at a startup um, and, and we were still in single digits uh, in terms of how big our team was, you're not, you don't have time to just do data science. Um, so I ended up learning a lot about UI UX and graphic design and project management. Um, and it was kind of this really cool experience to get um, a very, very inside look at to how a business runs. How does a startup run? What needs to be done? Um, so on any given day, I was doing data science. Um, I've pitched to VC firms, which is kind of wild. And you're just like, what is, you know, like me, like you want me to do this? Um, and so it's, it's been this really great opportunity. And I, you know, looking back on it, um, I think it really worked out well. I think it gave me a lot of skills that helped me continue to not only get data science jobs, but to get data science jobs that um, also required levels of leadership and management and, and kind of people skills. Um, because it, it was very much being at a startup and doing data science, but also having this, this you know, kind of can-do attitude. Like, we need someone to make sure, uh, you know, to sit on set and run lines with someone. And like, yeah, I can do that. That'll be great. Let's try it out. Um, and so kind of collaborating with people across all different, different areas of the organization. And it was, um, it was a lot of fun. And Megan? Sure. Um, so I guess my first sort of data science -y job, um, I was actually a data analyst at a market research firm. This was my first job um, after leaving grad school uh, when I moved to Pittsburgh. Um, and I honestly felt very naive. Like I didn't know what to expect really at all. Um, and a lot uh, was just sort of like ramping up to all these things that I was really un unfamiliar with and then trying to figure out ways to um, apply what I knew about statistics um, and research um, to the projects that I was working on. Um, so, um, it, yeah, it's hard to say whether or not it was all that I thought it was going to be, um, but um, it was definitely an interesting experience because uh, I had a, it was, I was confronted with a lot of ambiguity in my role. Um, I was the first hire of this sort of, of this sort of role for this company. Um, so I had to sort of like take a lot of agency in like how I was going to solve problems and how I was going to communicate um, why I made the choices I did. And I feel that I learned a lot from doing that um, in that role. Um, and then now in my uh, role as a data scientist at Kaggle, um, that's definitely a lot different. Um, and uh, I think the biggest thing that I've learned in this role was uh, the importance of communicating to different audiences. Um, this has uh, definitely been um, something that I'm really glad to have had a lot of mentorship from people like Anna in particular, um, is just sort of thinking about um, how do I communicate this technical concept to um, people internally? How do I communicate it to um, different levels of expertise uh, in the community? Um, what do I need to change about my message, the delivery? Um, and um, so I think that was, that was the biggest thing that I've learned. Um, that I didn't expect to learn, I guess, as a data scientist, so. Yeah. Um, so we talked about this a little bit, or I kind of mentioned it, but I'd like to dig in a bit more. You know, all of you, it sounds like, have really turned, found data science opportunities within existing roles, which can be, you know, a really great way of making a career switch, obviously. Um, and so like, what are some practical tips that you have for building a good reputation and network, um, kind of as somebody with data science capabilities within your own company? Jess, do you want to start? Yeah, I think a lot of it is getting to know people. Um, I have a really fantastic mentor, and her kind of go-to is to take people for lunch, um, get get out of the office, get with them, eat lunch, and get to know them as a person. Um, there, you know, we talk about like work-life balance, and like work-life is separate from personal life. But I, I think that when you get to know someone for who they are, because um, you you can't just leave who you are at home and come to work. Um, so, so it helps break down barriers, right? Like when you take someone out for lunch, you're doing something enjoyable, you're out of the office and you're, you're building that relationship. And I really think that ultimately what you need to do to, to build a data science team, especially if you're a team of one looking to expand or trying to justify the need for data science is you need buy-in from across the organization. And, and to do that, you really do need to build relationships and, and kind of influence other people. Um, no one's gonna necessarily hire you to be the chief data scientist. Um, so you have to do a lot of peer management. You have to manage up, you have to manage the people above you, you have to manage the people around you. Um, and I think, I think taking them out to lunch is a great way to start doing that. Megan, how about you? Sure. Um, so um, I think sort of to kind of like piggyback on uh, what Jesse was saying, I think really understanding what is the landscape in the current 
um, you know, your current job function. So what are other people working on adjacent to you, um, getting to know, um, getting to know them, their problems that they're solving, um, and the things that they're generally thinking about. And, you know, of course, one way to do that is to set up one-on-ones with people um, to just kind of, you know, ask questions. Um, and I think once you've, you've sort of like understood the landscape of, of, uh, of I guess, the, the where you're at um, uh, among your coworkers and their projects, um, you can identify then opportunities where you can say, hey, if I applied my skills here, um, I could really make an impact. Um, and I think, you know, when you've developed relationships with your coworkers, um, even if they're not people that you work very closely with, you know, um, they'll trust you and sort of, um, you know, you can find these opportunities to do, I guess, like 20% projects basically. Um, and um, I think that's a really great, you know, great way to have um, influence, build a reputation. Um, of course, you want to do whatever you can to sort of be successful uh, in executing on the projects and the way that you sort of like help your coworkers. Um, and again, I would point to really understanding um, the problems that they're facing uh, is key to doing that. Sure. And David? Yeah, so I think just to echo on those comments before, you guys have made some great points. To me, you cannot underestimate the value that relationships play at work. And I think that that's something that I really learned in finance where I need to understand the problems that the, the businesses face and my counterparts in different functions in order to help them unlock value um, and have the organization reach its full potential. So. Some of the things that I've seen that have worked well in data science, it's similar to, you know, a, a Kaggle approach that you would use, and we use it in finance too. Develop a quick proposal um, of, of projects that you're working on, then get the buy-in through those relationships that you have. Um, and if you don't get the buy-in, then you scrap that project and you move on. But I think if you have a process that you use with your network that you can quickly identify projects that you're working on, and that they have value, you'll establish a reputation for success and then people will want to rally behind you and work with you. Yeah. Uh, and Jess, you mentioned uh, your mentor. We actually had a question come in just about, you know, if you, if all of you have mentors and if you do, how did you find them and kind of how has that relationship helped you on your kind of career switching journey? Um, Megan, do you want to start? I'm, I haven't kept track of who's starting, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, yes, I'm definitely a huge advocate for finding mentors. And um, I guess just I want to clarify, I guess what I mean by mentor, this can sort of fall along the spectrum of having somebody who's a formal ded dedicated mentor that you have like regular check-ins with and, you know, they know that you're their mentor and things like that. Um, and it can also just be like, um, you know, considering your coworkers mentors in uh, like learning from the experiences uh, that they have and um, seeing their successes and understanding how they made their decisions. That's like another way to sort of pa be a, like see, have passive mentorship. Um, <laughs> um, and I guess uh, I, yeah, so I have a lot of people that I consider mentors. Um, Anna is of course one of them. Um, <laughs> uh, another uh, mentor that I have is um, somebody who is, uh, he's a Googler and he's also going through like a career transition as well um, to from uh, like a more de developer advocate role that I'm currently in. Uh, he, was, he was formerly a product manager. So now he's a developer advocate. Um, I'm a developer advocate who's sort of interested in product management. Um, so I just reached out to somebody who's in my office um, and found him and now we get we get um, coffee every other week. Um, and he's just been a really great sounding board. Um, and it kind of goes both way, ways because, you know, he's sort of trying to break into um, how do I have influence on a product through like community advocacy and speaking and things like that. Um, so um, that's been a really great relationship. Um, and uh, as far as advice for finding mentors, um, honestly, this is kind of embarrassing, but I just Googled it. There's actually a lot of like blogs about how to find a mentor, how to ask somebody to be a mentor um, and things like that. So um, yeah. And then, oh, the one other piece of advice I would want to give is um, be really open uh, to feedback. Feedback is like absolute gold in your career. Um, and I think um, taking feedback well, 
really reflecting on it um, and um, thinking like very, very seriously about um, how you want to transform that feedback into you know, changing what, how you uh, approach your, your job um, is, 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 is uh, incredible, so. And Jess, how about you? Yeah, um, I really have, you know, I, I definitely agree with Megan on this idea of that some of your colleagues are mentors and you have interpersonal relationships that can be mentorship. Um, and in my situation, it was at my last position. I remember sitting down with my, my boss at, on my first, you know, one-on-one -on -one, and she was like, what can I help you learn? Like, what is the one thing you want to get out of this? And, um, you know, I knew I, I was good on the data. And so I said to her, I need to learn how to navigate office politics. I need explicit advice on how to how to do this. And she's phenomenal at it. I mean, she is like, I've, I can't get over how well she is at office politics. Um, and so I was like, will you please teach me everything you know? Um, and so it just kind of, we met, we started meeting weekly. Um, and even when I transitioned out of the position, I still meet up with her uh, once or twice a month for lunch. And we just kind of talk. It, it's more of a collegial um, relationship at this point, which is kind of nice. But I'm still like, hey, this is going on in my life. And how would you handle this? Or like, this person said this, and they want to do this this way. But I think, you know, I have a different approach. And, you know, getting that feedback, like Megan said, the idea of getting feedback on even how to approach um, projects and pitching projects and not even the data science side of things has been so absolutely invaluable to me. And David? Yeah, no, I think this is a great question. I don't, you know, at GE, a lot of my mentors have just been informal. Um, but I do remember early on in my career when I was uh, meeting with a CFO for a specific division and I was a couple of years into my career and he'd worked at the company for 20 to 25 years. And I remember him looking at me and saying, he's like, David, you know, the only thing that differentiates me sitting behind this big desk and you sitting on the other side. And I said, um, no. And he replied that it's experience. So I think that you want to reach out to your mentor to have them share their experience with you so that you can make good decisions on your journey throughout your career. They say that history definitely repeats itself. So that's to me what I look to a mentor for to help guide me when I get to forks in the road to avoid making a wrong choice that my mentors perhaps could have had experience in that area. Thanks. Awesome. Um, and so, you know, a couple of you mentioned, you know, feedback and how important it is. Um, and we had a question come in that said, how do you demonstrate that you have humility to learn and also receive feedback in kind of your app application or interview? Um, and then I would also kind of add on, you know, how did you learn to take feedback? <laughs> um, David? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that early on in my career, certainly getting feedback was hard. And I think that, um, one of my toughest managers, she would just always, you know, yell and, and make you feel like you you didn't do a good job. And I and I think that I struggled with that form of feedback. But eventually what that experience taught me was that I had to separate my personal feelings from my professional feelings at work. And once I realized that the feedback I was getting at work was how I performed and how I could be a better employee and not necessarily who David Havera was. I was able to accept feedback um, much, much better and grow from it. I think during an interview, I think coming in with just the, the essence that you are humble and that you're, you're listening, you're attentive and that you ask good questions, I think kind of shows that you have that ability to accept feedback and you can get that across with, with your body language. Yeah. yeah, I think similar to what David has said, I think that um, showing and demonstrating that you can accept feedback uh, involves separating responses or, or reacting and responding, right? So when someone gives you feedback that might really sting, um, you can you have a choice. You can react and you can get flustered and you can get upset um, and you can do whatever or you can respond. And sometimes that's taking a deep breath and asking questions. I always ask questions so that I make sure I understand what is this feedback that I'm being given. Um, and if it's feedback about work and it's from, you know, someone who, who is integral to my project success, a lot of what I'll do is I'll go, I'll try to implement the feedback um, and then check in a week later. But even when I'm getting the feedback, I might even say something along the lines of, what does this look like to you? So, um, 
you know, an example actually from teaching was I remember I was told that I needed to be assessing my students more often. And I definitely reacted. I was like, I don't have time to give a test every five minutes. And she was like, okay, like calm down. Um, and she's like, try again. And so I, she gave me the opportunity to respond. And I was like, what does it look like when I assess my students more often? And she had five options and she's like, this is what it looks like. It takes less than 30 seconds each. Which two are you going to try? And I want you to do them for two weeks and then come back. Um, so that to me was just a really pivotal, pivotal moment to be able to say, okay, you're in a conversation with people and someone's giving you feedback. It's because they care. They care on some level about your success. So make sure you understand what they're giving feedback on and then make sure you understand what it looks like when you implement that feedback. And then don't be afraid to say, hey, I've been trying X, Y, Z and either A, it's not working or B, it's working great um, and asking for more feedback. I think that's one of the best things that you can do to show that you're open to learning is to say, I'm trying this thing and it's, I need more help. Um, and it's, it's not a weakness to ask for help or to ask for guidance on how to do something. And Megan? Yeah, this is, this is a really um, great question. Um, and uh, it's definitely a tough, nuanced question to answer. Um, I think uh, definitely um, will echo what David and Jesse have both said. Um, I think uh, in my experience, like I've been really fortunate to have um, a lot of people that are just great at giving feedback. Um, so that's been really valuable to me. Um, and, um, you know, what has made it valuable is that I, I understand that, um, you know, the purpose of giving feedback is ultimately um, to further some shared goal that we have. Um, and sort of like centering uh, your response to that, I think, um, is a way to handle feedback. And then, you know, a way to sort of get to that point, uh, like Jesse said, is to ask questions and really make sure that you understand, um, you know, where is this feedback coming from? Uh, is, is, yeah, completely agree with that. Um, and then as far as sort of demonstrating it in an interview kind of context um, and demonstrating that you have humility, um, I think uh, um, if you have opportunities to sort of like tell a story um, about a time that um, maybe you made a mistake or something that didn't go as planned um, and sort of like how you learned from, uh, learned from that, uh, I think definitely can show humility and that you're you're, you are receptive and open to um, like feedback signals um, and you use those to improve your work. Um, and David, I wanna make sure to ask you this question. It came in a while ago, but um, yeah. somebody wrote, I have two children with cystic fibrosis and wanna find avenues through data science to improve treatments and help find a cure. What platforms and organizations can I look to for opportunities? Yeah, I'll be on the, the Slack tonight. There's actually one of my friends at GE. She has actually two daughters with CF. So I definitely, she is um, active in the community and I could get, definitely connect you to, to reach out. I think part of um, the journey that you're on is knowing that you're not alone. So I'd be happy to make that connection for you. Thank you. Um, and I know we, we're kind of getting close to time. So as kind of a final question, um, I'd love to know, just looking back at your careers, is there anything you would have done differently? Is there any kind of decision that you regret? I know, you know, it might be easy to feel like, I wish I had started in data science. I wish I had the answers <laughs> right at the beginning. So, you know, what is your perspective? Um, Jess, do you want to kick off? Sure. I think for me, um, I got really good at figuring out things kind of as I needed them. And so if I could do it all over again, I think I would have spent a lot more time um, being a little more disciplined about my learning rather than just kind of grabbing things as I needed. Um, and I, I wish that I hadn't been afraid of GitHub for so long. Um, I really, really put that off for a long time. It was like, no, I can't put anything out unless it's perfect. Um, and then I just kind of was like, who cares? Like, let's, let's put out garbage code because that's the only way I'm, get, way I'm gonna get better is if someone comes along and is like, hey, that's garbage code, let's make it better. Um, so yeah, I really wish that I had, um, I had started GitHub a long time ago instead of, um, you know, not so long ago. That's great advice. Uh, Megan? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I thought about this question and uh, honestly, I wouldn't want to go back and change anything because I'm very happy uh, where I am right now. <laughs> I feel like I've been very fortunate um, and I feel like I'm on a great trajectory. So I really honestly wouldn't change anything. Um, but if I knew that going back and changing something wouldn't sort of, you know, alter significantly <laughs> where I am today, um, I think uh, I would have probably studied computer science um, in either high school or um, college. 
uh, in some capacity at all. Um, <laughs> in my infographic, I pointed out that my, my dad pushed me to study either computer science or engineering. And, you know, I really kind of balked at that and said, no, I'm going to become a musician. Um, and, uh, you know, I think from an early age, I really had like a strong affinity for computers. I was very curious about computers and coding and things like that. And I, I feel um, if I could go back, I would have sort of like fostered and developed that from an earlier age. But yeah. David? Yeah, no, I think this is a good question. I think for me, it's, you know, probably the first 10 years of my career, I would always take a job based on you know, a hiring manager saying, you need to check this box, check that box, do this and that if you want to um, reach this place. And I think that, you know, that can quickly lead to burning out and, and losing sight of what you value and what you enjoy doing. So I think it, on, on, from my perspective, it's, it's just knowing that you own your career and no one's going to manage it or look out for you, but yourself. And if, I would caution anyone not to take a job just because someone has an opening in their organization, you know, take a job because you're passionate about it, that you, you want to do it and um, understand the, the path for a career, but you're in charge and just don't, don't give up believing in yourself. And if you're passionate about data science, you know, go for it. Just um, be patient and measured at the same time because it's a new field. And it's, as we've talked with all our winding paths, sometimes even when you're pushing so hard, an unexpected opportunity may and most likely will come up. Um, and I think that there's uh, open opportunities at at least some of the companies that we have. Uh, that you're representing. Is that true, David? Are you hiring? Yeah, we we're actually, I, I pushed really hard to try to get the opportunities posted on Kaggle, but I couldn't jump through the HR hoops in time. But GE will, uh, aviation will have several data scientist roles uh, posted on Kaggle here in the upcoming week. So I'm excited to talk uh, more and I'll be on the, the Slack uh, networking, virtual networking event later tonight. Great. Jesse, are there any opportunities at Teaching Fest right now? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're a small nonprofit, um, so opportunities are fairly limited. Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting conversations in early April to, to really look to bring in someone to complement our data science by doing database architecture and development. Um, we haven't fully scoped out that role, so I don't know the, the ins and outs of it, but I can tell you somebody who can, who can build beautiful databases and then keep them running uh, is definitely someone we're looking for. Cool. Um, and Meg, I'll give you last plug. <laughs> sure. Um, so I think uh, maybe this was highlighted in another session, but we are hiring competitions data scientists. Um, I think that role is on the jobs for our jobs board. Um, but if anybody has any questions about working for Kaggle, um, you know what it's like. Uh, happy to answer any questions like that um, in the in the Slack. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was super interesting and I think inspiring conversation in a lot of ways.